good evening class and welcome back to yup master today we're going to be learning all about the frog all right so these are all we're going to be starting with the tetrapods and we are learning about frog today now frog is a topic which is included for your ncrt for your neat exams too all right many of the state uh, textbooks are not having for frog and earthworm in their portion but yes it is included as a part of your need so we will do it together all right so today is the first session of the frog and uh, let us see what all this frog is all about all right so let's begin first of all uh, the most common frog seen in india is uh, in the one that we are going to be studying about it's called as rana tigrina and it is commonly called as the indian bullfrog okay rana tigrina all right Ahead, we also see that frogs are poikilothermic animals. Poikilothermic means that these are cold-blooded animals, all right? And they are anamniotes, which means that they are not having an amniotic membrane around them during development, okay? They observe mimicry. What's mimicry? Wherever they are, they're going to their body color, their skin color is going to adapt to the area around it just so that they can stay away from their enemies and protect themselves, okay? Also, we see that uh, they, uh, during extremes of summers and extremes of winters, they, they just go down into the soil and they go to sleep, okay? So, basically, their metabolic activities go very down. And we, we're going to be calling these as summer sleep and winter sleep. Summer sleep will be called as estivation and winter sleep would be called as hibernation. So, these are just some general uh, characteristics which we can see in frogs, okay? Now, frogs and toads. This is one thing that uh, many kids do ask, what's the difference between them? Well, we see that frogs are the ones which are mostly living in water or nearby water, right? They're amphibians. Whereas the toads, when you find the toads, na, they are uh, they're mostly, you, you see them in the drier environments, not near too much of water. That's where you basically found a find a frog. Uh, find a toad all right even when you see the size of it the size of a toad is generally bigger and its skin is generally drier as compared to that of a frog frogs generally have this moist sticky slimy skin okay as uh, whereas when we talk about the toads they are dry and a little rough skinned animals all right then we see here, as I just told you a little while back, that whenever the conditions are in extremes, whether being we're talking about extremes of summer or we're talking about extremes of winter, uh, during the adverse conditions, the frogs go and they hide themselves. Okay, so can you see how it's hiding itself? Where does it hide itself? In the moist soil. So frogs, ba frogs basically, they bury themselves in the soft and damp mud. And what do they do when they go inside there? They're going to be slowing down their metabolism during this period. Metabolism slows down, doesn't stop. Metabolic activities are going on. Just that they are going on very slowly. At this time, because they're not coming out on the land and they're not catching food to eat, then how do they survive? They're going to be surviving on the glycogen and whatever fat reserves have been made as long as the period was there when they were outside, okay? So that's how they survive in this hibernation and estivation period. And at this region, when they're inside the soil, uh, naturally, they're going to be having to breathe. But then how are they breathing? They're going to be breathing through their skin. So you can call that type of breathing as a cutaneous respiration, okay? So cutaneous respiration means breathing occurring through skin during those periods, okay? Now, as we saw a little while back that whenever during the extreme of summer climate, when the frog goes inside the damp soil, you can call it as estivation. But then when we see that it is going in the damp soil in the winter period, we would call that as hibernation. All right. So you have summer sleep estivation and winter sleep as hibernation. All right. Now look at these here. Look at the beautiful pictures. Okay, can you see these three frogs? And can you see how they have actually managed to look just like the area where they're sitting on? This is a property which we call as camouflaging. Okay, so when we see that the frog is camouflaging, we can see that they have the ability to change their color in order so that they can hide from their enemies. All right. Okay, ahead we see. This Rana Tigrana. Okay, so we're going to be learning all the points about Rana Tigrana. 
First of all, when we see the external features of this frog, we see that the skin is smooth and it is slippery too. Ever tried catching a frog? Rainy season. The best thing that kids do is the most fun things that you could do in as being a kid during rainy season was to go running after a frog and trying to catch it. Whenever you try to catch it, what happens? Doesn't it just slip away from your hands? Because its skin is so slippery and smooth. All right. So basically we see that whenever you're talking about frogs, they have uh, their skin is always an olive green brownish kind of color on the dorsal side. Okay. It has dark and irregular spots. Can you see those irregular spots present? Okay. So it's olive green with irregular spots. Also, we see that on the ventral side, it's going to be comparatively quite pale in color. So ventral side is pale yellow in color. Okay. Also, um, the frogs, they don't drink water. Okay. Ever heard of this? Frogs don't drink water, but whatever water requirement is needed by the frog, that requirement is going to be fulfilled by the skin. So basically, it's the skin. And that's why we say that frogs are living near water. So basically, it doesn't drink the water, but whatever requirement is needed is going to be done through the skin of the frog. All right. Okay. Now, next we see here, when we talk about other parts of the external features of the frog, we see that there is a head region. Okay. Then there is a trunk region. All right. And also, we see that there is going to be absolutely no neck and no tail present either. Okay. So there is a head. There is a tongue, uh, trunk, but there is no neck and no tail, all right? Also, certain features that we find are that on the eyes, okay, on that eye, there is a membrane which is going to be helping in covering the eye or you can say protecting the eye. And that membrane is going to be called as a nictating membrane. Where is that nictating membrane here? Can you see this part here? Okay, this region over here is called as the nictating membrane. All right, so that's the nictating membrane there. Okay, let me remove that line so you can see things better. All right, so that's the nictating membrane. And also we see that the nostrils are present. Okay, can you see how over here? This is the nostril region here. Okay, and can you see this yellow circle that I've made here? Well, this is the ear of the frog and the ear of the frog is going to be called as the tympanium. All right. You can see that it is a quite, it's a depressed ear. Okay. And uh, you don't see that external apparatus present like how we have a pinna. So this doesn't have anything like that. It's just a depressed one. It's attached almost at the level of the rest of the skin and it is called as the tympanium. Okay. Also, we see that uh, the frog has got four limbs and it has got hind limbs too. All right. So let me just hide myself for a little while here. So the frog has four limbs. It also has hind limbs. Now, what's the difference between them? Four limbs and hind limbs, all of them or rather both of them have digits. Okay. So when we say that they have digits, what exactly um, is the count of the digit is what we need to be knowing. Okay. So counting of the digits, there will be five digits in one limb and there will be four digits in the other limb. So let's see what that is all about. The four limbs are going to be ending in four digits, whereas the hind limbs would be having five digits. Just like how we have five fingers, in their hind limbs, they have got five digits, okay? And just like um, in their, uh, like they have five digits in the hind limbs, they have four digits in their four limbs. All right. So that was all about the external uh, features of the frog. All right. When we see the hind limbs, the hind limbs are large and they are muscular. All right. And here are those digits. Can you see how, like if you have observed in ducks, similarly over here also, the digits are having webs present between them. Okay. These webs which are present between them, are actually going to help that frog in swimming. So it helps the frog swim because of the presence of those webs present. Okay. Now look at this over here. Okay. You must have seen this present in all the frogs. And also this is a very normal color. When you look at images, when you see other things on TV or around you, you might see that these frogs have this, this in different colors. And sometimes the colors are very vibrant and very pretty colors. 
So these structures that you're seeing here are called as um, the vocal sacs. Okay, what are they called as? They're called as vocal sacs. And remember one thing, these vocal sacs are present only in the male frog. So because of the presence of this vocal sac, you are able to tell whether this frog is a male frog or whether it is a female frog, which makes it very obvious that the frogs are having or are showing sexual dimorphism, where just by observing the external features of the frog, you're able to determine whether it is a, a male frog or a female frog, okay? So this what you're seeing here is a vocal sac. And why is it present in the male frog? You know why? These vocal sacs are the reason why you hear that loud irritating sound of the frog. How do the frogs go? Kri -kri -kri -kri. So that loud irritating sound are those made from those vocal sacs. And do you know that why do they make that sound? Well, those vocal sacs, that sound that you hear are basically made in order to attract the female frog. In fact, did you know that the male frog which makes the loudest and the maximum time duration sound of that vocal sac is the frog to which the female would be attracted to for mating and for reproducing. So vocal sacs are basically just uh, for making noise in order to attract the opposite gender frog. Okay. Also another point is present for sexual dimorphism and those that point is called as the copulatory pad now before the copulatory pad, pad i'd like you to observe over here this line this round structure what was this round structure called as do you remember that i told you it was a depressed ear and we had called it as tympanium okay it was called as tympanium all right so coming back to our point of sexual dimorphism when we see again the point, again, this is going to be present only in the male frog. And this is called as a copulatory pad. Now, what is the meaning of copulatory? Copulatory means mating, all right? So, mating. So, basically, we see that it is because of the presence of this pad present on the on that four limbs of the frog, of the male frog, which allows it to have a hold or a grip on the female frog when they are going to be mating, all right? So the copulatory pad is absolutely absent when we're going to be observing a female frog, okay? All right, so two points of sexual dimorphism. First point were the vocal sacs and second point is the copulatory pad, all right? Okay, now let's move on and we start with the very first system of the frog, okay? What is that system? It is the digestive system. This figure that is given to your right part over here are basically the whole, all the visceral organs of the frog, okay? Can you see how those visceral organs are placed? It looks like one tubular structure, okay? Now you can see, just pay attention to this uh, diagram, very beautifully given diagram here, that this here is the heart, okay? The first part heart, if you can see. And um, ahead, Continuing from the mouth would basically be this region over here, which is the esophagus, okay? Can you see this two lobe liver? Okay, one here, one here. This is the liver. And below the liver, this part here is the gallbladder, all right? Then uh, you have got below the esophagus is the next part here, which is the stomach, all right? After the stomach would come the whole digestive system, remaining parts, the small intestine, followed by the large intestine and finally it would be ending in the cloaca okay so basically cloaca is an aperture in the frog which is going to be a common opening for three different systems okay so this cloaca region is going to be a common opening for three systems which system cloaca helps in opening of the digestive system the digestive system Okay, next it helps in opening of the reproductive system. Okay, and third is going to be helping in opening of the excretory system. Okay, so this is all about the cloaca. Okay, it is a common opening for digestive system, 
respiratory uh, reproductive system and the excretory system all right also if you have a look at this diagram we we just saw, saw the parts of the digestive system but there are also the kidneys present here do you see these kidneys here okay and on top of the kidneys there are these fat bodies what are the significance we will learn that when we do ex the excretory system all right so these are many parts there is also between the stomach and the duodenum we will see that there's going to be a pancreas present too all right so let's begin with the digestive system of the frog and just like that in humans all right just like in humans even in the frogs the digestive system can be divided into basically two parts okay which are those divisions first is the elementary canal the whole tube okay and second are going to be the glands so even in the frog just like the humans digestive system is divided into two parts first part being the elementary canal second part being the digestive glands all right when we talk about first we're gonna be beginning we're gonna start with the elementary canal okay before that remember that frogs are carnivorous okay they are carnivorous and i'd like you to take a look at this picture closely than you normally would just observe how the tongue is of the frog over here can you see that the tongue is not attached at the back side but it is attached in the front side can you see that yes can you see how the tongue is attached in the front over here this is the point of attachment can you see how this is the part which is actually free okay so when that frog is going to open its mouth and put its tongue out the tongue is attached here and that tongue can come out like this and catch that insect and put it back in so this is basically how it works okay our tongue comes out like this their tongue comes out from backwards out all right so we see that the frogs being carnivorous that is why um, they don't eat vegetables so they don't have a lot of digestive process to be happening inside and that's why the length of their intestines are quite reduced as compared to others all right so let us start with the different organs which are there in the elementary canal of this frog okay this is the diagram which is given in our ncrt textbook so basically children although we did have we did just see a fancier diagram this is the diagram that you're going to be having to remember the labels that you're going to be have to be remembering okay first and foremost okay the first part of the elementary canal begins with the mouth now as the mouth is going to open there's going to be a cavity inside and that cavity can be called as the buccal cavity or you may call it as the buccopharyngeal cavity okay buccal cavity is basically going to lead to a part which we call as the pharynx okay that's why sometimes you may also call this as bucco pharyngeal cavity all right so buccopharyngeal cavity is going to be leading next to the pharynx pharynx is going to be leading next to which part the tube and that tube is going to be called as the esophagus esophagus ultimately is going to be leading to the stomach okay and when we see ahead let me just go away for a second so you have a good look okay when we go ahead the stomach is gonna go ahead and it will open up and it will open up into the intestine now when we talk about the intestine over here there is going to be a small intestine and there will be a large intestine too all right so the intestine opens and then finally that intestine is going to be opening into the rectum rectum is going to be opening up into the anus okay and anus opens like in the cloaca so instead of the anal region over here we're gonna be directly calling it as the cloacal region all right so I hope this whole uh, series of the organs which are present in the digestive system of the frog is making some sense to you. Okay, starting with the mouth, then comes the buccal cavity. After the buccal cavity comes the pharynx, then the esophagus, then comes the stomach, then comes the intestine. In the intestine, you're going to be having a small intestine and you have a large intestine too. Finally comes the rectum and finally you can see in this diagram this is where they're going to be showing the rectum and this part here is being the cloaca. Remember that the cloaca is a common opening. Yes, remember cloaca 
again i'm remembering this okay i'm, I'm noting this point again common opening for which parts the the reproductive okay the excretory all right and the digestive okay so cloaca is basically a common opening for all of these all right okay now let's continue ahead okay now we see here that we're talking about other parts okay the details of some of these organs over here let's start with the details of the stomach first of all the stomach is a tubular organ can you see how the stomach is looking like a tube okay it is a tube it is a broad thick walled tube and it occupies basically the left side of the body cavity okay so over here since this is a uh, zoology we're talking about this you can call as the left side this you can call as the right side okay so that is occupying the left side of the body cavity okay let's see ahead also other points that we mentioned about the stomach anterior and the posterior ends both of them means the, the topper part and the bottom part both of the these ends are having sphincters okay so sphincters are basically going to prevent backflow of any food okay so that the food falls and goes in a particular manner also we see that along with the stomach uh, there are digestive glands also present remember i told you that elementary canal and digestive glands are the basic two parts whenever we are going to be talking about the digestive system of a frog okay now talking about the digestive glands well there are first and foremost is the liver present okay liver just like in humans even in the frog the liver is the largest gland present and the liver is going to be secreting bile okay and just like in humans even here the bile is going to be stored in the gall bladder but when we talk about bile then what exactly is bile made up of bile basically has no enzymes okay remember this is the same when we talk about our body even in our body bile is having no digestive enzymes but what does it have it has bile salts and also it has got bile pigments too so there are bile salts there are bile pigments okay but there are no digestive enzymes present here okay now we also see that um the the liver the bile duct that's going to be coming is going to be opening into the duodenum where is the duodenum the first part of the small intestine just like we see in humans so when we talk about the intestine the initial part okay the beginning part of the intestine is going to be called as the duodenum and that is basically where the uh, the ducts will open up in order to carry bile inside that intestine so what is that duct going to be called as it's going to be called just like in humans just like in our body when we studied the hepatopancreatic duct and when it when the bile is passing inside the duodenum along with the bile even the pancreatic juice will be collected from the pancreas and it will be put inside the duodenum what is the duodenum first part of small intestine so that it can help in the digestion of various food products okay now after the liver the next gland that we are seeing in the frog is going to be called as the pancreas okay this pancreas where is it located it is located between the stomach and the intestine in a region over here okay this is basically where the location of the pancreas would be here also the pancreas is irregular it's elongated and it is a mixed gland what does pancreas produce just like humans it produces pancreatic juice and that pancreatic juice is going to be containing digestive enzymes okay now it is going to be a mixed gland just like that in humans what is a mixed gland if you remember from our tissues chapter mixed gland is the gland which is going to be producing both the things means it's going to be having an enzyme release also and it's going to be having a hormone release as well all right so what are the hormones which are going to be produced they're going to be producing insulin and glucagon which part of the pancreas well the endocrine part of the pancreas and those cells of the endocrine part of the pancreas are going to be called as the islets of langerhans okay so basically pancreas even for the frog has got two parts to it remember those two parts first part is called as the endocrine part okay endocrine part are made up of a group of cells which we're going to be calling as the islets of islets of langerhans 
okay and second part is going to be the exocrine okay exocrine part are made up of cells which are going to be helping in secretion of the pancreatic the pancreatic juice all right pancreatic juice all right next when we come ahead uh, this is just what i spoke to you about when we started with the digestive system that remember just notice how the tongue of the frog is not attached from the back but the tongue of the frog is attached from the front region okay so whenever the frog is actually going to be throwing its tongue out in order to carry in order to capture any insect then it is the back side of the tongue which is being thrown out so that it can catch hold of that insect okay so also we see that can you see how there is a tip and it's not a single tip okay can you see how that tip is bifurcated okay so that's why we say here that the tongue is a basically it is a bifid tongue okay can you see that bifid tongue okay also over here you can see the uh, nares or you can call them as nostrils you can see the presence of external nares okay over here you can also see the presence of internal nares over here all right so you have external nares and you have internal nares now whatever food that is being put inside the mouth enters into the cavity where you can see can you see this presence of these small teeth and all present here also okay so that whole cavity which is containing the tongue containing the teeth containing those nares that cavity is going to be given the name of buccopharyngeal cavity buccal cavity entering into the pharynx so it's called as the buccopharyngeal cavity all right okay also when we talk about the digestion since we've learned all about the names of the organs let's see let us just see that how the digestive process is going on it is very similar to that of the human beings where we see that digestion of food is going to be majorly taking place with the help of hcl so hcl is going to be helping to break down things remember they're going to be eating insects and when they're eating insects there's a lot of protein breakdown that they're going to be have to do so the digestion of food takes place by hcl and also by the gastric juices which are secreted right from the level of the stomach okay the walls of the stomach that food whenever whenever the hcl okay whatever food is there at the level of stomach right now we are talking about stomach whatever food is there has been acted upon by hcl also has been acted upon by gastric juices who has secreted both of them secreted by walls of stomach that is partially digested still a considerable amount of digestion is is still pending which would happen at the level of the intestine okay so this partially digested food at the level of the stomach is going to be called as chyme what is it called as it's called as chyme c h y m e chyme all right now this partially digested food is ahead that is the chyme is going to be passed down into the first part of the small intestine and that's going to be called as the duodenum well when we study the human anatomy human digestive system for us also the first part of our small intestine is called as the duodenum so that chyme is passed into the duodenum and remember it is the level of the duodenum at the level of the duodenum where the bile is going to open from the gall bladder and through that duct which is carrying bile it is also going to be carrying the pancreatic juice so at the level of the duodenum the duct is opening which is going to be calling called as the uh, common bile duct it's going to be opening it's going to be bringing pancreatic juice and it's also be go going to be bringing bile juice so pancreatic juice and bile juice open into the duodenum by a duct which is called as the common bile duct for the frogs okay now what is the function of bile over here bile is going to be doing the work of emulsification of fats now your next question is going to be ma'am what is emulsification okay well emulsification basically let's just see how it looks like okay let's see if at all you have one big fat drop okay this is a big fat drop now do you know that on this big fat drop no matter how strong that enzyme may be okay those enzymes are not going to be able to break down that fat drop not at all so what's the solution now what do we do 
let bile come into the picture okay now when bile comes here bile is made up of bile salts okay so as soon as bile salts come near that fat drop the bile salts are going to be creating a coating around that fat drop and as soon as the coating is getting exposed to water what would happen this is all salts what will happen to the salts when it is exposed to water yes won't the salts start to dissolve so basically when this layer will dissolve okay the fat drop inside is going to become small 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 fat droplets so the fat drop is going to be turning into small fat droplets and this process of conversion of the fat drop into small fat droplets is what we're going to be calling as emulsification okay it's called as emulsification of fats and who is getting this done this is being done with the help of bile so this is a major function of bile that would be emulsification of fats okay all right so we see ahead bile is doing the work of emulsification of fats and also we see that the pancreatic juice that is present is going to be helping in the digestion of carbohydrates and also in the digestion of proteins proteins just like in humans the digestion begins at the level of the stomach that's why stomach over there in the frogs also have hcl and also have a uh, gastric juices okay concluding here when we talk about the digestion the final and the last process of digestion is happening at the level of the intestine we see that uh, the digested food is absorbed and it's going to be absorbed by what so when we talk about this level okay at the level of the intestine this is where all the nutrition that the frog is going to be eating has to be absorbed there and for increasing the absorption we need to increase the surface area so instead of having an intestine the inner wall instead of it being plain like this the inner wall of the intestine is going to be thrown into folds so inner wall of the intestine looks like this and what have we achieved by having the inner wall like this we've achieved that we can have a larger surface area if at all the surface area is larger this is going to be helping in absorbing more nutrients so the larger the surface area the more absorption can happen okay and these over here the structures here are called as villi okay those structures there are called as villi so we see here that digested food is absorbed by numerous finger like folds in the intestine and those finger like folds are called as villi and also there are going to be cells on the villi which also have small small villi on them so those are going to be called as microvilli all of these structures whether you're talking about villi or whether you're talking about microvilli both of them are present basically for increasing surface area just so that the rate of absorption can be increased all right also we see now after the absorption takes place what happens to the part which is undigested so the undigested solid waste is ultimately going to be moving down and going into the rectum and from the rectum it's going to be passing out through this cloaca okay so that's the cloaca remember cloaca cloacal aperture it is a uh, basically it is going to be for a common opening for three systems the reproductive system the digestive system and the excretory system okay so that is the cloacal region all right now coming ahead let's just revise certain points which we have done until now talking about the morphology skin of the frog is smooth and it is slippery also we see on the dorsal side there is olive green dark irregular spots ventral side is comparatively pale yellow in color doesn't drink water how does it get water by retaining it through the skin okay also talking about uh, the the hiding of the frog okay when it hides during extremes of summer you can call it as estivation during extremes of winter you may call it as hibernation 
all right also talking about the different parts of the elementary canal which you need to remember there is a mouth leading to the buccopharyngeal cavity the pharynx the stomach the, the esophagus the stomach the intestine having the small intestine and the large intestine and then the rectum and finally opens into the cloaca remember the cloaca is a common opening for three systems i keep saying this over and over just so that you remember how important this part is cloaca is a opening for three systems the digestive system the reproductive system and the excretory system too all right okay let us move on next to the next system after the digestive system we carry forward we move on towards the respiratory system and remember that the frog is an animal which is going to be residing on both land as well as in water so that is why it is being it is having different types of uh, parts involved in order for breathing there are three types of respiratory surfaces that the frog is going to be using so that it can breathe wherever it may be there is a first type of breathing which is being done through the skin and because it is being done through skin we may call this as the cutaneous respiration okay cutaneous second is the respiration which would happen through the mouth we'll call it as the buccopharyngeal respiration and third is the respiration which is being done through the lungs which we can call as the pulmonary respiration so three respiratory surfaces the skin the pharynx and the lungs all right so when we talk about when the frog is in water okay so inside water when this frog is swimming how is it breathing well in water we see that the skin is behaving as a respiratory organ and because skin is behaving as a respiratory organ we're going to be calling this kind of respiration as the cutaneous respiration it is the most important type of respiration for the frog and uh, we see that the scaleless skin that's present is going to be helping in this and that's why that skin is thin it is moist and it is vascular so that it can absorb the oxygen from the water okay all right also we see uh, that the skin is basically it is permeable to oxygen and permeable to carbon dioxide too all right so skin is permeable to both of this the oxygen which is there it is dissolved in mucus okay and also it is dissolved in um, in the moisture of the surface okay and what happens is that it is vascular so all the uh, oxygen that's present is going to be diffusing inside the blood capillaries so that there will be exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide the skin basically has to be moist in order for cutaneous respiration to occur okay do remember that that there has to be moist skin present there and that is the basic reason why the frogs are always found around water okay around them so skin should be moist for cutaneous respiration to take place okay all right look at this here when we talk about the frog when it is on land okay the respiratory organs that it may use are the buccal cavity okay the skin and the lungs too okay so let's talk about the first type and let's talk about the buccopharyngeal respiration okay so we see here that the respiratory exchange of gases that's happening okay whatever exchange of gases is happening on land is occurring through the buccopharyngeal cavity and that too because it is moist and it has a lot of blood vessels present there okay it is lining so that's why the exchange of gases is possible there also uh, in addition to its skin and lungs when it is on on land this is going to be helping it okay the respiration happening through the mouth only so basically it will open the mouth and because there are so many blood vessels here there will be exchange of blood, there will be exchange of gases at that region next talking about the pulmonary respiration respiration which is going to be using the lungs of it okay whenever we see that the frog is on the land okay we also see that it breathes through its lungs okay and we see that the lungs basically they are pink they are highly vascular and they are sac like organs okay so look over here during pulmonary respiration okay we see that the buccopharyngeal cavity okay can you see what region that we're talking about over here this part over here 
this is the buccopharyngeal cavity okay this over here are the nostrils remember we learnt about the external nares so these are the nostrils and you know that the nostrils open into the buccopharyngeal cavity so this is that cavity we're talking about so during pulmonary respiration this buccopharyngeal cavity that's present in the frog it is going to be behaving as a force pump now what's it gonna be doing let's see that okay so because of the elevation of that buccopharyngeal cavity air is going to be forced through the glottis what is the glottis glottis is the area where the uh, respiratory opening is okay the area where at par of the or just near the esophagus but where the respiratory uh, pipe would open okay now so due to the elevation of the buccopharyngeal cavity it is above that is going to force air through the glottis region here okay and it is going to be entering into the lungs so this is the region where the lungs are the region where the gaseous exchange would take place okay so remember one thing generally when we talk about the uh, buccopharyngeal cavity this is an area where you would basically talk about when you talk about mouth you know you, you you're indicating about the digestive system but over here what's gonna happen air would enter into the mouth but then instead of going into the stomach that air would be passed into the lungs region and what is the opening of the lungs area called as it is passed into the glottis so the air that is opening and entering into the mouth region that's going to be pushed into the lungs so it is the at the lungs where the gaseous exchange can take place but how is it reaching the lungs it's reaching the lungs through the buccal cavity the buccopharyngeal cavity okay then at the level of the, at the level of the lungs once the gaseous exchange is done then what happens at that time the floor of the buccopharyngeal cavity is lowered down and then all the air is going to be passed back out just in the similar way that it came in okay so uh, as the after gaseous exchange the floor of the buccopharyngeal cavity is lowered and then the air is going to be going out or the air from the lungs goes out through that very same buccopharyngeal cavity and then out through the nostrils okay all right so we are done with the digestive system we're done with the respiratory system okay remember respiratory system there was cutaneous there was the buccopharyngeal respiration and there was the uh, pulmonary respiration which was done through lungs all right so that was breathing part let's move on and let's go ahead with the circulatory system of the frog okay remember being an amphibian the frog is having a three chambered heart okay not a four chambered heart it's having a three chambered heart okay so let's begin circulatory system of the frog deals with the heart deals with the blood and also deals with the blood vessels okay the heart the blood and the blood vessels these three things are there do notice how there is only a three chambered heart okay two atria one ventricle so we see here that the heart is a muscular organ and the heart is situated in the anteroventral part of the body okay in the ventral region antero remember it's a chordate so chordates basically have their circulatory system the main major organs in the ventral regions okay it is situated in the anteroventral part of the body it has two atria and it has one ventricle that when that ventricle is not divided means that there is no septum there is no partition between the ventricles so as the blood enters into the ventricle it's gonna get mixed okay so it has two atria and one undivided ventricle uh, it is covered on and uh, just like how we have a covering around the heart all around the heart all around the word we use is peri for heart the word here also we're gonna be using is cardium so a layer which is double layered all around the heart it's gonna be called as the pericardium same goes for the humans as well okay now um i'd like you to pay attention to this diagram that's there given here okay look at this diagram and i'd like you to look at this region right here okay it's called as the conus arteriosus okay what is the significance of this conus arteriosus well the whole ventricle remember this is one ventricle okay that ventricle is opening into this structure here and this opening or this structure over here this region here this opening is going to be called as the conus arteriosus so we see that the ventricle 
okay this whole ventricle is opening into the conus arteriosus and can you see ahead how that conus arteriosus is going to be bifurcating okay so that is bifurcating into two branches how many branches one branch is over here okay let's color it with a different color one over here okay and one over here so you can see how this region of the conus arteriosus has bifurcated into one region here and into another region over here okay so where is that carrying blood from all of that is going to be carrying blood from the ventricles given below over here all right so this is that whole system that i'm talking about how the blood from the ventricles is passing outwards also can you see how once it has divided over here again ahead also it is going to divide and ahead we see that it is going to be dividing into three regions one two and three okay over here also towards the body okay towards the body and don't forget it also has to go to the lungs for oxygenation all right so because the blood is here also going to be entering into the heart twice but because there is going to be mixing of blood over here this is going to be called as an incomplete double circulation okay incomplete double circulation in our body it is a complete double circulation okay that's the basic biggest difference here don't forget the name of this word and this word was called as the conus arteriosus what was conus arteriosus where the ventricle is going to be opening up okay now there is something which is called as a portal system what exactly is a portal system normally how does the routine go whenever you are talking about when we talk about heart okay basically from the heart what comes out aorta okay that aorta would bifurcate into artery okay arteries form arterioles they are going to go ahead they would be forming capillaries okay and then the capillaries unite they're going to be forming venules unite forming veins unite forming the inferior vena cava comes together and goes into the heart this is the normal uh, basic system how blood supply is given to any organ right so basically what we see is from capillaries it is have it is a it is a standard thing that the blood has to go to the venules but if at all sometimes we see that instead of from the capillaries instead of going to the venules sometimes instead of from capillaries it can go to another organ altogether and then it will enter into the venules so when this type of system happens where the capillaries of one organ is going to meet with the capillaries of another organ then the system which is formed between them is going to be called as the portal system all right so portal system portal veins are basically those blood vessels which are which are going to be connecting the capillary beds of two different organs okay all right now a detailing of that would be done when we study the chapter of circulation right now for frogs understand that they also are having two different types of portal systems which are those two different types of portal systems there are first portal system uh, first of all understand portal system means we're talking about the venous connections remember after the capillaries first portal system between intestine and the liver remember even we have this kind of portal system and this portal system between the intestine and liver can be called as the hepatic portal system hepatic portal system second portal system is the one which is going to be connecting the lower parts of the bodies and the kidneys okay lower parts of bodies all the excretory waste material which is found in that lower parts of the body will be taken directly to the kidney so that it can be excreted out okay so that is another type of portal system which is found in uh, in in lower vertebrates and that type of portal system is called as the renal portal system 
So frogs basically have two different types of portal systems, the hepatic portal system and the renal portal system. Okay. So this was all about the portal systems. Now, when we talk about the blood, okay, we're talking about the circulatory system. Remember, speaking of blood in the frog, the blood is made up of plasma also and cells also. So just like human blood, here also there's going to be a liquid part and there's going to be a solid part. The liquid part is going to be called as plasma and the solid part naturally will be called as cells. So which are the cells present? There are RBCs which we can call as erythrocytes. There are WBCs which we can call as leukocytes. And there are platelets which we can call as thrombocytes. Okay, so erythrocytes, leukocytes, thrombocytes, RBCs, WBCs, platelets, all right. RBCs are nucleated. This is where the basic differentiating part comes from humans, okay. In humans, the mature RBCs do not have nucleus. Why? So that it can accommodate more and more hemoglobin. But when we talk about the frogs, even the mature RBC are going to be having nucleus inside them. The WBCs also just like humans are nucleated, they are amoeboid cells, okay, and their basically role is going to be in uh, defense just like us in humans. And do you know that uh, the functions of platelets in humans? Yes, it is clot formation. So here also when we talk about the thrombocytes, that is the platelets, they're going to be playing an important role in hemostasis. What's the meaning of hemostasis? Heme means blood. Stasis means to stop. So it's going to be doing the work of stopping blood from uh, excess of bleeding. Okay, so whenever you get hurt, so you need immediately a clot to be formed there. And that clot forming there is going to be done with the help of platelets. Okay, so thrombocytes are going to be helping in hemostasis, that is stopping of bleeding. So children, Today in this lecture, we have completed half part of the frog portion. The remaining part we'll be doing in the next lecture. That's day after tomorrow. So I hope you do stay tuned with me at that lecture. Now remember one thing that uh, what are the systems that we have done today? We first started with the digestive system. Okay, we move, went ahead. We learned about the respiratory system. And finally, the circulatory system. Okay. Now, if you uh, if you did understand this lecture, please give a like to this video. And I hope you you are already smart enough. You must have gone and subscribed to our channel. Now, if you've done with this lecture and if you found that you have um, understood this lecture and you want to just give yourself a small test, what you could do is just for a, a matter of around 20 MCQs, you can go and solve it. Because remember, if you're talking about the NEAT, then these, these are the basic MCQs where it could be asked from, okay? There are very limited MCQs when we talk about frog. If you solve all those MCQs, you know that any one of these only would come for your NEAT exam, okay? So go ahead, go to our Yupmaster app, download the app, go to the uh, 11th NEAT portion when you look for today's lecture. There's going to be an assignment around it, uh, just below it. Click on the assignment and solve those 20 MCQs so that you know that for your NEAT exam, if any MCQ does happen to come from frog or even if you want to learn about the earthworm, in my previous video, you can go to the YouTube playlist and you'll find videos of the earthworm as well. So do solve those that assignment and uh, that will help you out for your NEAT exams, all right? So see you in my next lecture, day after tomorrow, where we're going to be discussing the remaining systems of the frog. And until then, you guys stay home, stay safe and take care.